Today we'll be looking at the orchestration of the theme for The Bishop Treacherous. And this is a really fun character, the villain of our story, skulking around. It's going to be important to pick instruments that really represent this character in that very first statement of his theme. So let's take a look at what I chose. What we see here is the original piano sketch and the instruments that I've chosen to play this very important first statement of the melody. The original piano sketch was in the key of D half hole diminished, and I'm just going to play that for you so we can remember what that melody sounds like. As good as our melody sounds in the piano at this pitch level, I need to find a transposition that works with these other instruments. So I've chosen to transpose up a fourth to G half hole diminished, and this puts this contrabassoon right into the perfect register for this melody, its middle register. Now, this contrabassoon sounds an entire octave lower than what's written here on the score, way down where this tuba is sounding. And it can go lower still, all the way down to a low B flat. Let's take a listen to this and see how it matches our treacherous villain. <laughs> okay, I love that sound. It's got that quirky, off-kilter, villainous vibe we're after. I think it just works perfectly for this. Let's look at some of the other instruments and their ranges. And, you know, I've been using the word ranges and uh, registers, but they're not exactly interchangeable. Range is kind of the extremes, the lowest note and the highest note that can be played. Whereas registers talks about how different portions of that range sound. So here we can see the tuba is starting in its lower register and moving up into its middle register. And, you know, the thing about registers is that certain instruments in certain registers have different tones or they might not be able to play at the same dynamic level. So taking all of those things into consideration as you orchestrate are important. Let's look at the bass clarinet and bassoon here. Now, you can see that even though they're written and they look like they sound the same as this contra bassoon in the same range, they're actually sounding an octave higher. And again, these are really nice registers for this melody in these instruments. Let's listen to this melody now up an octave higher than we just heard it in the contrabassoon. Finally, let's listen to all of our instruments playing this theme together with the understanding that if this were to be developed into a longer piece or it were a score to a movie, we could take any of these instruments as solo instruments or in different combinations to get different colors and different sounds for this theme. Let's take a listen to this. Once I decided that this was the best transposition for these particular instruments in this particular portion of the theme, I also had to check it against the entire score because, of course, it affects the entire score. So for example, I have a trumpet passage at the end of the piece, and I've got to make sure that now that passage sits correctly in their ranges, in their registers. So you can see how important it is to make these decisions early on in your orchestration process. You don't want to go down the line and then find out something doesn't work. Okay, now looking at this melody, we can see it's very low. You know, it's down in the basement. So how are we going to orchestrate to make this work with this very low melody? Let's take a look at that. First, let's listen to what the woodwinds are playing here to support that low melody you'll see that they're marked at a lower dynamic level and are much higher in range. Let's listen to that. So you'll notice that 
even though this oboe one lead line to the accompaniment has a very strong melody, it doesn't compete with our main melody in our lower instruments. That's partly because it starts on off beats here, whereas in the original piano part, it was in concerted rhythm with the lower melody. And its range is divided by so much that you can hear them as independent parts. Here, where we go up to this D, one of the higher notes, we're still an octave and a fourth away from the lowest note in the part. And some of our notes, like this E, are two octaves and a six away from this highest note in the oboe part. Also, this pickup note that I added in the low melody draws your ear to that melody before the accompaniment begins. Let's take a listen to that. One thing you might notice is that I have some crossed voices in these woodwind parts. Usually you wouldn't want to do that. So, for example, this B flat moves down to an A flat, and this G starts below the B flat and then moves up above the A flat to a B flat. So, why did I cross those voices? Well, for several reasons. First and foremost, I don't want to have any repeated notes in a part, because it would ruin the integrity of the phrasing where I'm slurring from a note up to another staccato note. So if there were, say, two B-flats in a row here, that kind of phrasing wouldn't work. Also, it's slightly an experiment here to see if mixing the colors of these chords in different ways adds to the quirkiness of the piece. In the end, this is a very subtle difference, but of course, over time, lots of small changes can add up to something big. Let's look at what the other supporting instruments are playing. Here in the harp part, we're mostly doubling the woodwinds, but some changes had to be made to the voicings due to the fact that our half-hole diminished scale has eight notes, and it would require too many quick pedal changes to play the exact voicings that we see in the woodwinds. The strings are playing the same voicings as the woodwinds here, yet we don't have to worry about the phrasing that we did in the woodwinds since they're playing pizzicato and every note will be attacked. So any kind of slurred phrasing here won't make any difference to the sound. Let's listen to everyone playing this small section of the score. back on this short section that we just went over, it's interesting how many steps had to be considered to get to this point, from what transposition to use to have our instruments that represent our character be heard in their best ranges, to what accompaniment to play to support that melody. You know, there's just a lot of things to think about as you're going to do this, as you search for the sound for the piece. Another thing that I found interesting when I just listened to this back is I remember that I had a comment from a subscriber, from Charles, who said that there were portions of the piece that reminded him that the villain views himself as a hero. And, you know, I thought, that's very insightful. Of course, the villain doesn't see himself as a villain. He sees himself as a hero. So this one spot that Charles pointed out from the piano sketch, I decided to honor his idea with a small fanfare for our villain. To make it a little less heroic, I used straight mutes in the brass to give it a more quirky, offbeat sound. So that just goes to show that orchestration is so much more than just deciding who plays what notes. It's a form of storytelling, and through that storytelling, you can add depth to your piece. So thank you, Charles. That was a great idea. Now I just want to look at one more thing before we play the full piece. There are several tempo changes throughout the music. Here you can see we're moving to dotted quarter note equals 59, a faster tempo than the previous section, which was dotted quarter note equals 52. But how did I choose this faster tempo? I think, if possible, 
it's nice to have a relationship between the previous and new tempo. And this symbol here shows us that relationship. It means that this beat in the old tempo that could just contain two eighth notes can now contain three eighth notes in the new tempo, showing that relationship and acceleration in speed. I'll back up a little bit and we can listen to this tempo change and take note if this relationship between the two tempos helps to make it feel smooth and natural. All right, I think it's time to listen to the orchestration for the entire piece. I've written a new intro that's more ominous, more foreboding, to lead us into that quirky, villainous, skulking bishop theme. This one was really a lot of fun to do, and I hope you enjoyed the process. I want to say thanks to everyone following along, and welcome to the new subscribers. And now, let's listen to The Bishop Treacherous, and I'll see you all next time.